My name is Jesse Roth, and I'm the director of the Institute for the Development of Human Arts. Um, I'm a white woman wearing a black t-shirt. I have dark brown hair and it is in a bun on top of my head. I'm wearing glasses and I have some houseplants behind me. Um, yeah, sitting here in my apartment. And we are, yeah, just super thrilled to invite you here this evening for decarcerating care, community-based healing alternatives and how to build them. Um, and we can go to the next slide and I'll just tell you a little bit about the Institute for the Development of Human Arts, otherwise known as IDA, if it's your first time um, joining us. So IDA is a community of current and prior mental health service users and survivors, psychiatrists, psychologists, and other clinicians, activists, and artists. And we've all come together with this common goal of transforming mental health care. And what we do here at IDA is we are advancing critical, effective, and scalable alternative approaches to mental health through collaborative education and community development. And what really makes um, IDA unique is that we are integrating experiential and academic knowledge in order to challenge the idea that only those who work in the field of mental health are the quote experts. And our goal is to shift power dynamics in a system that we find generally only privileges professional experience at the expense of other forms of knowledge. So would like to share a couple of community agreements with you this evening that we use at IDA and these really apply to the chat. The first is the shared expertise and wisdom. Everyone brings their own expertise to the conversation and we can all gain from and respect each other's various expertise. Collective liberation, overcoming oppression aids everyone's liberation. It is our responsibility to challenge various forms of prejudice. We educate in the spirit of solidarity and hold each other accountable without criticizing who we are as people. And lastly, listen like allies. We respect a wide diversity of choices and perspectives, even when we disagree, and we don't judge or invalidate other people's experiences. And a couple of notes on accessibility. The first is that we have live closed captioning available tonight. Uh, you can click the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen to turn this on. Uh, we also have two ASL interpreters joining us today. Thank you so much for being here and they'll be uh, swapping out throughout the event. And lastly, we will aim to provide visual descriptions like I did at the beginning of the event. So um, giving a description before uh, the speaker speaks for the first time. And for a couple of notes on tech, we have a dedicated team member named Noah who's providing tech in the chat. So feel free to reach out to them if you have any issues. And as you can see, we are recording this event and we will be sharing it with everyone who registered later. And we invite you to join the conversation in the chat. We're a big fan of like resource sharing and all the links and all of the wisdom. So yeah, really encourage you to um, participate there. We also encourage questions, even though we might not be able to answer all of them, we always save the chat and we hope to engage with that on an ongoing basis beyond tonight. And so with that, the uh, format of this evening is I'm going to pass it in a moment to our moderator this evening, Mayowa Obasaju, who is an item member and has been on the organizing committee of this incredible event. And then we will dive into our panel, we'll have introductions, and then we'll have a little bit of Q&A. So, that is it uh, for now for an introduction. Thank you again um, for being here. We can take down the slides and I will pass it to Myla. Thanks everyone. Myla, I think you're muted. Muted, thank you every time. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Maya, and I'm going to give a visual description. I'm a Black woman with brown skin. I have curly micro locks that are colored a cinnamon brown at the bottom half. I'm wearing glasses, and I have a Black top with cream patterns on it and a blurred image in my background. I want to take the time to extend a warm, warm welcome to Ida's conversation on decarcerating care, community-based healing alternatives, and how to build them. This conversation is occurring in the context of our decarcerating care series, which has explored how to maintain the safety and health of our communities while preserving the rights and autonomy of those in crisis. 
With a focus on concrete steps and tools providers can take to decarcerate their practice. For tonight's talk, we are going to hear from a number of brilliant speakers who are going to discuss their work and how it is connected to decarcerating care. Now, we know that the work of decarcerating care and creating new care systems is a huge task and not a new one. But our hope for tonight is to present you with people who have done the work and are doing the work so we can both draw from their insights and walk away with tangible models and practices to implement in our own lives. And so it, in that, it's really important for us to name that there are so many people who have done this work, are doing this work, and we really want to validate and uplift that. This is a microcosm of a much broader movement. And so much of what we are doing in creating new care systems, um, some of which are outside the system, are often not seen as legitimate, especially when we have BIPOC, MAD, disabled activists doing the work. And though not seen oftentimes in some circles as legitimate, we know that it is, and we know that it is powerful. And so as we engage with this work, a theme that underlies and connects many of the panelists' words is this question. What would it look like if we could be our full, authentic selves in the spaces and places we inhabit? Can we vision answers both individually and collectively? Because the truth is many of us live in a world where people are labeled as mentally ill if they express a full range of emotions, rage against oppression, feel the pain of the earth and speak to that pain, engage in behaviors that are deemed outside of the boundaries of what is acceptable in our society or cultures, if we, and with all of that, what is deemed as acceptable or normal is often based on the values, beliefs, and actions related to white supremacy. It's often predicated on a white, middle, and owning class, heterosexual, Protestant, able-bodied, sane, neurotypical, age 30 to 45, English-speaking, in monogamous relationship, cisgender male, a minority, if it even exists, <laughs> that is held as the norm, the ideal, and the goal. And for many of us, we experience daily pressures to emulate this norm, which is a form of mental health oppression, where we are constantly sold the lies of mental, uh, we are constantly sold the lies of normality. This normality that disconnects us from ourselves, from others, spirit, earth, and sometimes then places us in restrictive communities, prisons, involuntary commitments, even jobs and spaces that tell us over and over again, we are not good enough as we are. Where, as the mental health and liberation policy by re-evaluating counseling states, that mental health is a pressure to be normal. And that pressure makes people feel abnormal, afraid of being different and afraid to question or try to change society. But how can we say no to a harmful and restrictive sense of normality? How can we honor all pieces of ourselves, honor our madness, honor our divergence, our expansiveness, honor our connections to earth, to spirit, to ancestors, and to community? And we can do that in so many ways. We create, we understand differently, we center those who have had the experiences and we cry, scream, yell, smile, laugh. We dance, play, be in silence on our realities and our inherent dignity. We take space, we connect, we transform, we heal, we embody and we rest. And maybe we believe that I, and I quote reevaluating counseling again, there's no set of expectations that we are trying to reach, only unlimited possibilities. And so tonight, the panelists today are going to speak to some of these unlimited possibilities and possibilities that build on the strength of communities built within and outside of and in between systems. And that speak to the strength of peers, of self-determination and cultural wisdom, of liberation and liberatory practices and cultural wisdom. 
spirituality and of the intangible and the unknown. And we are so very, very excited to start this conversation. And with that, we are going to start with the panelists. They're going to provide a brief introduction of themselves and then they will respond to the following question. What lineage or history brings you to this work? What political homes do you belong to? Or what social movements? And we will start with Yolo. Hello, everyone. This is Yolo speaking. Um, to give you an image description of me, I am a light brown black person with blonde hair. I am currently wearing a gray shirt, gray collar shirt with black flowers um, in my signature floral patterns, which I often do. <laughs> and I'm sitting um, at a brown wooden chair in a um, room with the door behind me. Um, I'm thrilled to be here to, together with you all to collectively imagine, um, reimagine, create um, this new world that we all are giving uh, birth to. I'm really excited. Um, who I am, I'm the executive director and founder of BEAM. Um, BEAM stands for the Black Emotional and Mental Health Collective. We are a national training, movement building, and grant making institution dedicated to the healing, wellness, and liberation of Black folks. Um, when I name my lineage that I come from, I recognize that and many times when I see this question, people often lift up the names that are recognizable. However, many of the names in the people who have um, supported me, who have cared for me, who have educated and trained me are not names that everyone in this room may know. There are many direct service workers, social, social workers, many folks who are survivors in communities who are doing first responder work. And so I wanna just lift up the millions, the thousands of names of folks who, um, who do the work but don't necessarily get their names elevated. Um, I think that's the lineage that I come from and the people that I celebrate and I'm consistently grateful for every single day. Um, that was my first question. I think the other question, can you remind me <laughs> what the second part was? I'm sorry. What? Yeah, um, I think what are the political homes do you belong to or what social movements? Yeah. Um, so I am a Southerner without a shadow of a doubt. My political home, I definitely come from sweet tea, country, uh, whiskey folk. <laughs> um, I was um, really kind of uh, brought into movement through the Atlanta community and surrounding areas, um, really through the work of people who were doing reproductive justice work, HIV and AIDS work, um, violence inter intervention and prevention work. Those are the folks that really um, ground me, anchor me, taught me, mentor me. And it's definitely where I see my political um, home. Um, folk And folks who are recognizable in that lineage, I would say are definitely like people like Bell Hooks, Brandon Lomax, Audre Lorde, um, many, many other, um, Starhawk, many others who have really inspired me and led me to this work. So I will stop there. Thank you so much. And next we'll hear from Vesper. A home, a home all to you. That is a thank you in Taino. And um, that's, that, that is my descent, my lineage. I am of the Kiskea and Boriken tribes. And I think something that's so important about that is that that affiliation, that ties to those grounds um, are, are so important to my work. I work as the chief operating officer at the Kiva Centers. Um, an indigenous peer run organization based on Nipmuc land, um, also known as Massachusetts. And I also do a lot of collective work through Madness Network News, a psychiatric survivor mad run initiative. And that really brings me to what movements I'm involved in and what work I'm involved in. Uh, I am what I consider a mad liberation activist. I think a lot of people define that in a variety of ways. Um, I define it as a liberation from our traditional understanding of emotional distress and mental health in our wider society. I do think of it as a very intentional way of decolonizing our ideas around emotional distress. Uh, the the way and the, the, the spaces in which I, I hail from and, and, and my learnings are really from the wider 
uh, mad movement spaces. And I attribute a lot of the knowledge that I've gained from peer support spaces. Um, as someone who was incarcerated in the psychiatric system for four and a half years of my life, I really dedicate my work to, to changing our understanding once again and transforming our approaches to mental health. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll have Ida. Hi, y'all. Um, I'll start off with the visual description. Um, I'm a mid-sized fat person, light skin with some freckles. I have short wavy brown hair with a side shave um, and a dangling hair wrap with various beads and artifacts on it. I have strong arched brows and brown eyes. Clothing wise, I'm wearing a black t-shirt. Maybe you'll, you know, there are some peaking mushrooms that sometimes are visible, sometimes are not. Um, tragically, Zoom is de-enhancing the glitter on my face, but I need you to all know that it is there. <laughs> it's important. Silver nose ring, black faux plug earrings, red lipstick, um, light little mustache. Um, and my background has a lot of framed pieces of art um, depicting it like a multiracial and fantastical assortment of beings, both real and imagined. Um, and there's a small hanging Puerto Rican flag. Um, my pronouns are they, them, or ella and le. And in terms of kind of where I'm coming from and where I'm housed, I'm currently in land and territories that have housed the Wampanoag, Massachusetts, Nipmuc, and Pawtucket peoples, as well as a long heritage of Black liberators. Um, but I was born in Taina territories of Puerto Rico, also known as Boriquen. Um, and I also call home a space in upstate New York, uh, land of the Asopas tribe of the Lenape people. And at the core, I'm an activist and an organizer. Um, yes, I work as a therapist. Yes, I work as a circle keeper and sexuality educator, but the core of what I am is an organizer. Um, so I do clinical work, but that's not the first thing I was born doing. Um, in terms of lineage, I'm just going to say freaky queers is the first thing I want to say, um, because yes, I could talk about LGBTQ activism and healing justice and transformative justice, and those all matter. Um, but those were not the first things that I ever felt or knew. Um, and so the first thing that I, you know, was born into was a lineage of freaky queers. Um, and so I like to say that first. But if we give the slightly longer answer, um, yeah, it started off with a lot of LGBTQ activism and sexual freedom work, then moving into more migrant rights and anti-racism as I started to realize the horrible colonial legacies in the land that I grew up in and was raised in. Um, and then I moved into anti-violence work, which led me to transformative justice work and healing justice work. Um, and those are ones that I'm firmly planted in right now, um, even though they're all still there, right? Like I am every age I've ever been. Um, similarly, I'm in all these movements, even if I move in them a little bit differently um, and more relatively newer right, comparatively to things like abolition and disability justice, because I had less lived experience with those things. So it was a, a bigger lift to be able to, to change my mindset to match those values. Um, and yeah, I think that's it for me for now. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. And next we have Anjali. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to all of y'all for being here. My name is Anjali Nath Upadhyay. She and they pronouns are fine by me. Uh, in terms of an image description, I am a visibly sleepy human with long wavy black hair and some graying silvery temples, uh, wearing a teal dress, holding a magenta and green hand fan, with a mediocrely appointed rental background for y'all to enjoy behind me. So far as the lineages that I'm bringing into this space, so much that I'd be honored to share around that. Uh, first, I'd like to lift up actually, and in, in terms of the visual description, I'm holding a photo of Dr. Hanani K. Trask, who I know that those of y'all tuning in from Hawaii and elsewhere in our decolonial struggles are likely familiar with. I bring her in first because 
On the institutional front, I had the honor of being invited to what was at the time the only indigenous politics PhD program in the settler colonial US back in 2010 at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. So a program run by Kanakamale Wahine, so all native Hawaiian women who are actively working to kick the illegal US occupation out of the Hawaiian queendom. Uh, and a program that although in the academic industrial complex is rooted in us remembering our ancestral traditions of meaning making, of perception, of being, not attempting to diversify a Titanic, not attempting to be legible within an oppressive context as if we don't have our own paradigms, but rather encouraging us to unlearn to then be able to be in a place to remember and imagine accordingly in the service of our collective liberation. So I'm also quite honored to be the founder and lead teacher in Liberation Spring, rooted in occupied Ohlone territory, Huchin, so-called Oakland, California. This is a grassroots adult education program that offers political education and consciousness raising in the service of our collective liberation. Shout out to some of the star seeds in the chat. We have some students coming through, participants from Liberation Spring and some participants uh, and students from moments when I was in the academic industrial complex previously. It's so good to see y'all and to have y'all here. Uh, I would also share that I'm the host of Feral Visions, which is a decolonial feminist podcast. So a lot more that we could get into later around this invitation to remember some of the movement traditions, right? Whether it is the abolitionist struggle and what was before the need for abolition are de decolonial movements in different parts of the planet and what was before colonialism so that then in this moment we can actually nourish our imaginations around what's after decolonization what's after abolishing not just cops not just social work not just psychiatry not just the prison industrial complex but all of the the interconnected systems and institutions of oppression that seek to monopolize our focus, our concentration, our understanding of where we come from and who we are. I'll leave it at that for the moment. I'm so grateful that y'all are here to be a part of this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we also have Gretchen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to join this panel, which I'm seeing the chats, everyone's like, wow, what a panel. And that's exactly how I felt when I was invited. Wow, what a panel. Can I just sit back and listen to everybody else? <laughs> Such a joy to be here. My name is Gretchen Moore. I am, um, I have uh, brown skin. Uh, I'm African-American, uh, have um, a pretty big uh, Afro curly, depending on how much uh, mousse I put in it. Uh, today, uh, hairstyle, I'm wearing a green shirt, uh, and behind me uh, is a very large fiddly fig plant of nine years that uh, is, is my best friend here in this office space. Um, I come from, I, I'm currently, uh, for the last six years, have been focused on uh, movement grant making, uh, movement driven uh, um, grant making with open society foundations, as well as uh, played a role in the advocacy and the development of quite a few campaigns to the open, open society um, policy center. Uh, namely, and most specifically, many of those campaigns have been in restructuring and designing a new space of safety for people, particularly those uh, of us with disabilities who are black, brown and queer uh, and uh, survivors of systems uh, uh, of oppression and pain. The uh, work that I've done with Open Society is taking me to many states. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but the um, to be able to show my gratitude and appreciation for the movements that have, have been feeding and fueling me uh, from the beginning. Uh, I originally uh, came out of a home of uh, uh, built out of an uh, intentional community. I love what was noted about frequent queers. I come from a household of frequent queers and I am one myself. And so I'm so thankful for my father who's a pastor and uh, also 
uh, a queer pastor who really led, led for the changes within um, the uh, Lutheran church and taught me to uh, fight for space for others to, to be included, but then don't stay in a place that doesn't want to include you. <laughs> um, I uh, definitely also grew up in a household, grew up very much um, driven and I'm a baby of the ACT UP movement. Uh, and uh, uh, really worked in within deeply within uh, even as a child within the harm reduction spaces uh, uh, in uh, in solidarity with and within my family of those who are living um, uh, with disease as well as those who are supporting and advancing uh, the sexual and bodily autonomy of sex workers. My uh, my political home. Uh, has been also uh, developed and supported through my teachers. I'm so grat grateful for Erica Huggins, uh, who was the first to uh, really develop uh, meditation-based and health-based practice within the Black Panther Party that has become mainstreamed um, within much of education today, Vanya Davis, uh, who uh, uh, was in absolutely in the support of the advocacy and the uh, transition of uh, uh, the support um, of the indigenous roots and uh, the uh, African diasporic roots of restorative justice practices that have very much been a part of my life. Uh, Audre Lord uh, as, as the base uh, very much uh, of my um, belief that liberation must be inclusive of the liberated liberation of our erotic selves. And uh, Gina Sharp and Larry Yang, who were uh, some of my deepest and most beloved teachers in the Theravada Buddhist um, uh, practice. I am, uh, I, I am Buddhist by identity as well as in that's this teaching community that I support uh, with the Insight Meditation Community Center of Washington. Uh, and so the uh, very much come from the Buddhist tradition, but my work in integrating and supporting uh, tantric and as, as well as other somatic practices has come from the pleasure activists and the TJ movement and also the disability justice movement. So, um, so thankful that so many others here uh, have been running in those movements and look forward to today's conversation. Thank you. And thank you all. Um, before we get started with the questions that we'll have for each of our panelists, I want to um, uplift the energy in the chat, which is a lot of gratitude. A lot of folks are already inspired, excited, um, impressed, feeling enriched already from the descriptions and from the introductions. And so I wanna let you all know that. So a question that we have for you all is when you think about decarcerating care, what is your vision for the future? What would a healing-centered system of care look like? Whoever would like to start can unmute. I would like to start. I think, and I also wanted to say, I didn't get to do an image description. You know, I have long uh, brown, black, curly hair. Um, I'm a mixed race indigenous person, light brown skin, and uh, behind me is a Hopi tapestry and a shamanic rattle on a white wall. Um, and I think to just start up uh, right there with that question on decarcerating care and what that means to me is, it's really um, in that idea of, of when we say systems of care, can something systematically inherently have care? Can it foster ideals of care? When we try to be um, inclusive, right? And we, and we talk about inclusivity, right? This concept of inclusivity, right? And the intention of inclusivity. Um, can something systematically that is designed by cis white men be inclusive? And I think from a design justice perspective, it makes me wonder, does does that mean that inherently we will always leave people out? And is there such a thing as a system of care if, if in its design and its inception, it doesn't involve many people and often can be designed to oppress those people? Because if you think about some things historically, like I'll speak from the perspective of psychiatric institutions, there were very deliberate federal institutions for natives to incarcerate natives and take them from their land and their people there were also the same attempts made 
to Black and African American folk early on. We're talking 60s, 50s. So if that's the roots of which we are working with, right, what does it actually mean to have a system of care, right? Is, is it actually a thing? Is it, 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 you know, that's just a question I, I beg to ask in response. I would love to take it from there because I was also thinking about the systems question as someone who likes to think in systems um, and wants us to have a, a world where we are humble enough to recognize when a system isn't working and who it's not working for as well as who it's working for. So I want us to have a, a care world where we can pivot. <laughs> so to me, that also brings in visuals and idea. Again, I think in metaphors a lot. So I think of an accordion where the bellows get smaller and larger or like a lung when you breathe in and it expands and it contracts. And a lung doesn't do its job if it's not doing both of those things, right? You need the expansion and contraction. And that's kind of what I see as far as a world of care that we can live in. It has to be something that adapts and shifts and changes. It cannot be static because we are not static. The environment is not static. Um, so to me, a vision of a care world is also one that's more ecologically balanced, a world that is more attuned to the geographies that we live in and the land that we're on. Um, it's a world where there is more attention to the different ways that we can heal rather than just go see a therapist. As a therapist, that's trash. <laughs> so I would love to see more things like animal-based therapies and healing, forest schools, um, moving again in different ways so that we can actually get people what they need and focusing on equity rather than equality in our care. Everyone doesn't need the same things, right? Like if, if, if for any of us who are in the world as neurodivergent or working with folks who are neuro neurodivergent, we already know that there's no single way that our brains work. Um, and, and acknowledging that to me is really important. And then finally, um, for, for care, just living in a world that doesn't use non-consensual suffering, confinement, and deprivation as the primary tools for change or modification. Um, and will that mean slowing down? Absolutely. Will that mean not having as much diverse products out on a market? Yeah, probably. But that's not inherently a bad thing. And so again, the humility of downsizing and de-escalating things that can 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 bear to be smaller so that other things may grow in their stead. So that's my thoughts. I love um, that. I'll go for it, Yolo, please. Um, first of all, I love everything everyone has shared. Thank you all for everything you've shared. It's really beautiful and powerful. One thing I was thinking about, or the first thing that came to my mind was I think about decarcerating care, I imagine the possibility of tools, framing, and language that are not rooted in pathology, colonization, and shame, right? Thinking about tools that center neurodiversity and not the medical model um, that we know that we currently have. Like I'm going to say the DSM, right? Which has kind of been one of my kind of private, kind of like, not even private, people know they're like, yo, you're always it's like uh, researching the history of the DSM and just recognizing the terrors that it has created and the, and the faulty ways it's been crafted has also that thing, <laughs> has, um, you know, I just imagine that a part of the carcerating care is that we have a new template to discuss shared language and frame how we understand ourselves and the different ways we show up in the world, right? That isn't based off our inability to produce for capitalism, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, that doesn't court center that. So I just imagine um, that a big part of that decarceration is really us building collectively new tools and framing and language and, and um, you know, manuals, descriptions, understandings that are not what we currently have as far as the DSM is concerned. Another big piece for me, I will say is, um, you know, I believe that this is one of the a really critical, like you know, mental health or wellness Ill, Ill, wellness intervention, however you want to frame that language, is really just having people having a living wage. Like you know, I'm a Taurus moon, so I'm going to bring in people need money. Like you know what I mean? Um, you know, we have a Black Parent Support Fund where we support parents who have children who are living with mental conditions or who are themselves living with mental conditions. And we've had to tell funders they were like, "Why are you just giving them five hundred dollars every six months? Well, how is that a mental health?" And I was like. Do you know how depression and anxiety is with without lights? Do you know what it's like to live with schizophrenia without food? Do you know like, but like the fact that that has to even be described, right? And like understood for them, right? Like
like, you know, is, is a big part of the way we think about these mental health frameworks, right? So I think about a living wage, I think about new tools and that and I'm framing for how we understand ourselves. Um, I think about the possibility also, you know, when I when I imagine what the care systems can look like in terms of proximity, I think about how powerful it'd be that like, you know, I live in a neighborhood or a community, you know, it's maybe like a couple of miles and there's like the centers that we all kind of go to where we're in that area, you know what I mean? That makes sense. Giving us the opportunity to kind of hold those folks accountable in a different way when we're in community together. If like, you know, if I know my neighbors and all of us go to the same kind of care spaces, we're able to say, oh, well, you know, there's some opportunity for the peer support, for the therapy, for the psychiatry or whatever framing. Maybe we don't even call it psychiatry anymore when we have a new world, right? Whatever we have, um, we're able to like really hold um, those folks accountable and responsible for our collective wellness in a different way than we are when we're kind of in our current structure, if that makes sense. So I'll stop there. Yeah, I could also certainly add the silos that we're groomed to imagine in are not helpful for answering this question. So whether that's having right certifications in certain disciplines and climate catastrophe not being in your field. So why would you think about it? It's not your responsibility. Uh, unsiloing our imaginations accordingly is everything to be able to engage this question in a robust, rigorous way. So reality doesn't exist in silos, even though the vast majority of professional training does. So back in, for example, the history of women's studies, ethnic studies, indigenous studies, even as compromised as those fields are, folks realized over half a century ago, oh, this disciplinarity, it's disciplining what could otherwise be so much more expansive modes of visioning within our social movements. So then some folks were like, what about the idea of, I've got it, interdisciplinarity, like looking at two things in tandem. And then other folks were like, okay, that's interesting. I'll raise you, how about transdisciplinarity? And yeah, that's a little more robust. And then if we really want to take our perception seriously, what about anti-disciplinarity? So if we've learned something in the field of mental health, right, or in the field of psychology or in the field of psychiatry, having the humility to acknowledge there are all of these other facets in the kaleidoscope that is our reality that are getting obscured if we're just putting up on a pedestal one form of jargon, one mode of perception, one textual community, right, of folks in a scene or a clique academically or professionally that go to these conferences, but not those, whatever it might be, that really merit unlearning if we're going to be able to engage this question in the service of getting free. And the last thing I'd mentioned would be Land back, shout out land back, when in doubt land back, right? Land back over land acknowledgements, right? Uh, there's just absolutely, like was mentioned in our lovely intro, no bypassing speaking to the ecocide that's happening right now and that how that impacts all living beings. Uh, so there will absolutely be no liberation without repairing our right relationship as a species with the earth. Uh, and so if we're not contending with that, whether we frame it as our broader kinship structures and responsibilities, then right, if we're just in concrete boxes continuing to engage these conversations We've also, as far as we've gone, hardly even started to scratch the surface of the praxis that's going to be required to be able to get us to collective liberation. Yes, um, I love this question. It is one that uh, comes up quite a bit with my work. And I always start with the first thing that, you know, my abolitionist uh, teaching has been that we, we as, as stated here, um, to create the new, we don't necessarily need to create any of the new. Um, the, even the, the language of systems uh, uh, that, that I know I've adopted and I've employed and had to change my thinking as to uh, absolutely, uh, whether it is uh, systems that operated before the destruction, before colonial destruction, or systems that have operated during, uh, despite uh, the corporatization uh, and the uh, devastation of really the industrial nonprofit 
<laughs> complex and and the medical industrial complex and 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 that uh, has what has been stated here um, much of where I see hope and faith coming forward are folks who are just trying to hold on to what has always been there um, and so we don't have to look very far uh, we just have to look quite differently uh, at, at what systems keep us alive I look to the spaces of the people who um, you know have been building uh, and unique uh, uh forms of care um and uh that you know that includes uh even at the very intimate level so i, I believe that uh the way forward is at a very intimate level for many of us um the work of, by mia mingus by ignacio rivera of even thinking about family systems uh and and how can we how can we support having these conversations and dialogues at the family level, particularly as being someone who lives with a disability and also lives in a household of many psychiatric survivors. Uh, I know that there, uh, there's a role that I must play uh, in their care. Uh, and there can be roles that many family members play, which actually move, uh, move towards the incarceral frame. Uh, it is often family members who are the number one callers of 911 that can result in, in a devastating way, the death of their loved ones uh, when the police respond. Gretchen, you're muted. I just muted myself, sorry. I dropped in the chat and I believe Loa has dropped in the chat um, for the rest of you also some resources and I think some other speakers, the resources of Million Experiments and Interrupting Criminalization, which are just wonderful partners that have uh, been working with me, Miriam Kappa. Been, we've been working together for about four years now, five years and you know, building out and how can we promote this stuff that's happening that people just don't know about, <laughs> um, and 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 it and it's happening, um, and particularly uh, I think a vision of it is you know Dream Defenders. You got Dr. Armin Henderson and the whole team in Miami that has built out this peer response network in a way of having some uh, having emergency response without it being a carceral frame. Um, that you have um, also uh, as I as I posted in out of Minnesota so many creative frames of care uh, that are being resourced by the communities, by the survivors. Uh, Erica Woodland of the Queer and Trans Therapists of Color Network has also built out, besides the amazing work the network delivers, they also have a fund, and I hope people link because I think there's an app, a deadline in April um, for application for um, their resources. Um, and and uh, absolutely, I know the folks on you know Yolo's got amazing <laughs> resources tied in with it with uh, uh, with Beam Networks resourcing as well. That 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 is the form of of creating our our our, our care. It, it exists already, and a lot of folks are just tying in. How can we? How can we build in collective care? How can we address transgenerational trauma uh, in a way that uses language um, that's accessible, um, but <laughs> can really um, blow that language apart? Um, I also, just one last thing, I would say that the, I think it's really powerful what I also learned through from abolitionists, particularly who are also survivors of sexual violence, uh, that, um, I think it's Rebecca Farr has a quote, just um, the future is not where there will be no violence, where there will be no sexual violence. And in this case, will there be no need for care? <laughs> when everyone's all healthy, please. That is not a future I ever envision will exist. <laughs> it, is, it is how we approach um, harm, how we approach exclusion, how we approach uh, the need for care. And I think one of the visions that she described that I just loved was relating to rape and most definitely um, the there are challenges uh, that people with disabilities, people with mental health needs have uh, as disproportionately targeted. And then also there's a mental health need of the care uh, in response to the harm. Uh, and she was stating that it's, you know, there's no longer need for hotlines. If any about that, 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 that one visual thing of there would be no, no longer a need for suicide hotlines and rape hotlines, all these hotlines where you're you needing to anonymously, anonymously report because of a stigma of being either a victim or stigma of having a need. Um, that's the future um, she was challenging us to think of where, where the care and the service 
uh, and the support uh, is so embedded in us understanding that's how we all liberate. It is how we all can thrive. And the needs of the person with a disability um, is, uh, is, is not simply a need, a burden to the community, um, but one that's actually going to free the community to engage its best and most powerful resource, which is human beings. So um, if people so choose, I'd love for us to just take a moment and maybe inhale the visions. Yeah, inhale and exhale the visions that were just beautifully and as someone in the chat said, needed now, not in the future, right? Are needed right now in this moment. If we can breathe those visions in and out. And we have heard, yeah, sorry, I, I, even, I need to, one moment, this is so powerful. Um, and gratefully, we have heard from everyone. We are going to shift and take a moment to ask questions of um, each individual and have moments for reflection. Um, we'll start with YOLO. What frameworks, perspectives, and context do you use to talk with Black folks, both people with lived experience and professionals? about mental health and community, community building via Beam. How does it differ or overlap with dominant narratives about mental health? Yeah, thank you for this question. So I'm gonna talk about one of our core offerings, which is our Black Mental Health and Healing Justice training. And this training was really coming out of the reality that uh, myself, and actually was co-created with Erica Woodland from NCUSIN, we recognize that there were a great deal of folks who had a lot of language around the discourse of mental health, uh, psychiatric survivors, but not necessarily always a lot of skills and tools to be able to hold the spaces that we often theorized, right? So we knew we needed more folks who had the skills, the embodied practice. And so we built a training for anyone who works and lives in Black communities that centers Black folks um, in our experiences and giving a framing and understanding of how to respond to crisis and dignity without the police, how to reframe the kind of current context of how we of how mental health has been understood, et cetera, and really center a liberatory praxis. Um, there are a couple of things that happen in there that are really important that I want to name. So the first thing is, um, whenever doing any kind of mental health training or wellness training or healing justice training, we recognize that all of us are coming in there um, with many things. And so all of our trainings start off with what we do, a lot of consent-based practice um, that really helps us take a sacred pause, um, really kind of pause the internalized capitalism, wants us to rush to the content, help us be able to, be able to ground and root ourselves in a way that is not um, that and ground root ourselves so we can get prepared for the information we want to digest. Because when I'm working with Black folks, all of us in some ways are survivors of the prison industrial complex, mental health industrial complex. So I really become, I've really, in my own experiences before Beam, was really just kind of um, irate, to be honest with you, about the ways in which they would jump into these heavy ideological conversations without giving people a chance to really pause, breathe, connect, and get them ready for that, right? And so it was just like so much there. And so we spent a great deal of time grounding, checking in, reframing, helping craft a space to create collective safety together, right? Understanding that's something we make together. Like as a facilitators, we help kind of introduce and then we collectively craft that. The other pieces that are really important anytime we talk with black folks around mental health or healing justice is really acknowledging the ongoing legacy of harm of the prison industrial and mental health industrial complex. And that most of us don't see those two things as distinguishable, right? That many black folks, their first encounter with mental health is not the like really beautiful old Sunday brunch therapy kind of session. And actually, no, it's actually the carceral system, which is actually really destructive and damaging and dangerous to our folks, right? So naming that legacy of harm, um, knowing that it is still it is still ongoing, um, not pretending that like all oh, these mental health institutions are going to be great. You're going to get a therapist, and it's going to be everything. No, that's not like the only strategy that's viable. Um, another important part of our work too is upholding the fact that we as Black folks in this country have always had tool, tools and strategies to heal. 
that we have a legacies of healing, legacies of what was never called peer support. But the reality is our ancestors, when, when we were enslaved on ships, we had to find ways to care for each other in that moment of distress, of trauma, right? We would not be here if we didn't have systems of care within the slaves' quarters or whatever, within our quarters, et cetera, to like navigate and support ourselves, right? So there were strategies and tools we've always had, whether it's the current day tarot ladies, whether it's the pastors and pastors, whether it's informal um, kitchen table conversations, um, you know, like barber salons, like really uplifting our legacy of healing so that it's not obscured by the white, the white kind of medical industrial complex that says only this is what is healing, right? So really uplifting that legacy and people will come into the sessions and they'll be like, you know, I never thought about that. I used to be the salon and my moms and all them would talk and they would cry and they would hold and they would process and they would help people get money to go to the hospital and do these things. I was like, yes. We have those systems already. And so I think even naming some of the, the beautiful things that you all were sharing, that Vesper to Gretchen, that like everyone was sharing, some of those things already exist in our world now, naming that they, they are here, right? And that we, and, then, and that a part of my work and my hope is to like uplift them and illuminate them and say like, hey, that what you just mentioned that happens. Maybe it doesn't happen on a big grand scale yet, but it's here, you know? So those are some of the things that are really important for me in the context of our work with Black folks is to name that history, to not pretend that these systems all always have our best interests at heart, but to also uplift that we have skills and tools and strategies to support ourselves. We can build systems of care outside of that system. We can navigate that system cautiously. We can advocate for each other and protect each other when we need to get certain things from that system, whether it's medicine or what those things are. But I'm really going in with that approach as opposed to the approach I've seen a lot of people do with Black mental health, with Black folks is it's like, you know, everything's great. You know, like you just go to get a therapist and it's going to solve all your problems and not looking at systems and structural issues. And also that therapy is not the strategy for all of us. It's just one tool that has significant limitations, right? So I'll stop there and I'll say a lot better. So. I think I'm gonna you unmute. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much. And I, I want to give anyone on the panel an opportunity if there's a response, a thought. I I I I would like to respond. I think it's 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 right on. It's good work. And I mean, I think we talk about the formalization of peer support a lot. Um, but like we don't realize that it's it's existed for hundreds and thousands of years, right? It's 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 interdependence that's existed in communities, right? It is it's working through suffering at the kitchen table with their hands in the soil. It is outside. It is it is together, right? And I think um, we have this this culture of uh, of. Of, of oh we must look to to this these hierarchies these people to, to to answer our questions you know and and that is a culture that that's something that comes from white supremacy largely you know um a lot of and, and a lot of taino tribes uh you know the, the people i hail from um we had chiefs who who were women women of color really doing that work and then when the spaniards came in a lot of that, 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 that colonization came in and we were hung in groups of 13 to symbolize Jesus and the 12 apostles. Um, our, uh, our work of collective responsibility and restorative justice and working together and a lot of these ideals we're trying to foster now were eliminated. So a lot of us who, who live in this wider uh, diaspora, right, we have to relearn and reconnect to those roots. And I think it, it, it goes back to what Anjali was talking about earlier. And um, really, we have to care and do the work for the earth because it, it, we're, we're at a point right now where, where if we lose the earth, or rather the earth no longer becomes inhabitable for us, right? The first people who are going to be impacted are, are disabled folks our mad folk, our people largely, right? And, and then folk aren't actually going to care until it actually starts to impact the more privileged populaces. We'll keep it short, but not everything needs to be scaled up. And we live in a country, if you're in the, honestly, most countries at this point are operating under, you have to scale it up. You have to make it bigger. And not everything has to do that. Um, and also, especially when talking about reconnecting, all of us are native to some place and some family and some lineage. We don't have to be co-opting other people's stuff. 
We can also create our own rituals and our own ceremonies. And if there is any kind of sharing, that's different than, well, that that seemed nice. I will do it at home. That's not the same as a borrowing or a, or a being given something, um, which I say as one of the like lightest skin people here who probably has a big load of European ancestry, like, yeah, we don't have to, we don't have to be co-opting things to make our own stuff. And we do all honestly deserve ritualization and ceremony to hold us and heal. Um, and there's a lot of different ways of doing that. And thank you, um, thank you both for responding and building um, with YOLO. With that, we are going to shift the question to Vesper. Um, it's actually coming off the, the questions around that's coming up in the chat and it's come up in this panel too already about um, interdependence, about community and what that can look like when we're talking about decarcerating care. So for Vesper, as you've been involved in building peer respite, how has institutionalized racism, whiteness in the mental health system impacted the work that you do? What is the power of a BIPOC indigenous approach to peer respite? Thank you for that question. There's a lot of power in it. And I think something that is so important to, to the model of peer respites and, and to what we're developing. And, you know, I, I use that term model, but I think, I think it, it, it really does point to what we were talking about earlier. It's attempting to really bring us back to our roots as human beings, as communities, um, and, and as reservoirs um, in a society that is inherently disabling and causing of emotional distress. So something that really brought uh, Karaya Peer Respite, the, the peer respite that I was involved in, in the oversight and creation of, and, and I'm still very involved in every day, although there's a whole team that, that, that's working on that now. It's uh, Karaya Peer Respite was really born from the Taino um, ancestral spirit for the moon, Karaya, whom, whom I'm wearing on, on my pendant today. And, um, as, as a symbolism for rest and self-reflection, but also states of mind, um, multiple states of mind, as there are many phases of the moon and, and the original roots of lunacy and the moon. Um, so, so I think that's, that's very important when we talk to, to, to just the root is, is that name first. And then secondly, something that's been so um, instrumental in the creation was really throughout COVID, there were a lot of um, people in wider communities being incarcerated in psychiatric institutions. And I really do use that term, being incarcerated in psychiatric institutions. And I don't think a lot of folks often take that, that terminology and, and think of it as incarceration. Um, and, and, and what was happening was, was that people were, were turning to these spaces because they were entering the mental health system or the mental health industrial complex more largely for the, for the first time, right? Even if they were um, indirectly impacted by it, but they were being very directly in their everyday lives impacted by it. And they were saying, oh, I really wish that there were that, that there were more peer respites that I could turn to, more models like this, right? Because there are peer respites in, in, in many different places. And so, so we were like, okay, what if we try to develop a peer respite? There has to be more and more mental health funding out there. So we did, we, we applied for that funding and, 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 we, and we wrote it to the best of our ability. So, I mean, I think it's important to understand that when you develop things like this, you're going to develop it within, a, within this wider uh, range of capitalism and inherent productivity and liability and risk culture and all of these really awful things that actually take us away from how do we presently sit in the sense of danger and unsafety in our society that is inherent that can be tied to our ancestral roots like i was talking about earlier i mean so many of my people historically were were, were killed colonized our culture was you know a lot of it what was eliminated and lost and isn't validated today and i live with that yet that is not often thought of when I am being given a mental health diagnosis, when I'm being assigned and told that this is what defines my distress, right? 
So when we talk about peer respite, we're really talking about, about it as a diversion from that larger mental health industrial complex. And the way in which I think a lot of folks don't, don't realize that we could talk about um, a culture that, that allows us to, to, to presently have the, the, the dignity to approach a lot of these distressing states of being that, that we can actually sit with someone in the space of their deepest suffering and, 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 and realize that, that, oh, wow, if I were to just really listen and be present with that person, right, and not assume what risks are going to um, occur organizationally or <laughs> with others, right, but, but rather what is best for this person, you know, and, 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 and what they're looking for, we could redefine a lot of our ideas and approaches. So, for example, one thing that I... I am focusing a lot on is in addition to police responses with peer supporters, right? And peer supporters responding to certain police calls, particularly for BIPOC folk in emotional distress, right? Instead of a social worker where there's a lot of violent history, right? With that white social work system. Um, instead, you could have a black indigenous person of color responding to that call being in that space. And then also in spaces like peer rest, but also having an agricultural peer specialist who's in space with you. And, and, and again, you know, um, allowing for that self-determination to really work with the land and gain that connection with the land. I think some of these ideas really take us away from this traditional idea of like, we have to have a formalized DSM. We have to have these formalized diagnoses. We have to have these models that exist in these ways. And in order for us to get there, we have to start introducing or continuing to introduce because we've already introduced it, right? These, these alternatives. So, so as we decolonize, as we dismantle, we have something else to turn to. Thank you. And we do have time for maybe one person, if there was a comment, addition, a thought. Uh, shout out to the Earth's moon. So thank you, Vesper, for bringing in lunacy, which of course we know, right, is such a gendered form of pathologizing, right, of gaslighting, of clinicalizing, of psychiatrizing. And just to pause and to ground in how disrespectful, right? To how many of our ancestral traditions, who of our people ancestrally didn't have a relationship with the moon, right? If we were gonna be wayfinding, if we were gonna fish, if we planted, if we harvested for our ritual, for our holidays, for our ceremony, right? For folks who menstruate, for tracking our period. I mean, we could continue just the audacity of a system that would lie so profoundly as if our relationship with celestial beings is a source of pathology or ignorance or unknowing. It's just such a profound example of the kind of, right, upside down world that is the mainstream, right, neo-colonial global mental health movement that would have us again diversifying poison at the expense of, like so many of the panelists have been naming, remembering with humility and respect for what has come before, well, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can reconnect with the moon. We can reconnect with our traditions and be wisdom keepers and knowledge keepers out of respect for our traditions that merit nourishing. Uh, so I, I, don't get me started on the moon, I could continue, but lunacy is such a, right, we do a lot of work in Liberation Spring and in a class that we offer called Gaslight the System, the politics of madness and sanity in reminding people of the power of lunar reconnection as one entry point into alternative modes of imagining what on earth these conversations about perception and psychic states could even sound like. So thank you so much, Vesper, for bringing that up. 
and thank you for up. sorry I just want to big up diversifying the poison. I will be quoting you on that. Brilliant. Say <laughs> that all day. That is literally what is happening, diversifying the poison. And it's lauded as something we should celebrate. We're like, oh, yay, we have a person of color who's like the president of the clan of mental health. I don't feel excited about that. Like, I'm not, that's not got me riled up. And then one piece I wanted to add too is that when I think about connecting to the moon, I think about what you saw, what you frame as lunacy, it always goes back to me that, that, Capitalism, white supremacy has a deep investment in us not doing that because then we don't become the kind of hyper productive, um, like super capitalist people, right? We, like, we can't do that. We're like, wait, what? I'm not doing that. I'm chilling. I'm doing this. I'm connecting this yeah. part of myself. This doesn't make sense. Why would I do that? And so it's like there's just an intentionality and in, in disconnecting us from that part of ourselves and our heritages, right? You know, so just naming that, just thanking you for both what you both shared. Yeah. And thank you all. Um, I am, I'm, oh, I wanna say something, but I'm gonna, I'm going to give um, Ida some time. I know there's so much here. And as the chat is saying, people want longer and longer with each of you, with all of you, there's so much richness, but um, yeah, <laughs> I do wanna give Ida a question of, as we've already started talking about, right? With the oppressive social controls tools used in mental health, how does one do liberatory work and collective autonomy? And what sustains that? I'm going to start from the last part to the to the first part. So this is sustained by connection, rest, and restoration. And restoration is not the same thing as rest. Restoration is the your battery's filling up, you are growing more resourced. Rest is just chill the fuck out, just stop, just pause. You might that might be sleep, that might be other things, but it is the just existing, and that's it. You not not focusing on too much else. Um, connection, relationship. We're already talking a lot about that, so I'll just leave it there. Um, this is also where hope as a discipline comes through. Shout out again to Mariam Kaba. Um, hope is not something that we have to just magically have. And in the world that we live in, yeah, no shit. Of course, we're not going to feel hopeful a lot of the time if we're just breathing in all these poisons, right? The, of, of all these systems. Um, and that's why we have to practice it. A lot of these things just need practice. So that, again, shout out to things like Cambridge Heart, which I'm on the board for, which is imagining alternatives to police response in the city of Cambridge and Massachusetts. Shout out to the One Million Experiments, right? Like part of this is about celebration, like, ah, we need to celebrate to continue moving and going because otherwise it is so easy to fall into hopelessness and why am I even doing any of this? Um, so big shout outs to celebration, big shout outs to things like, and I was kind of making a joke about this earlier, but literally just putting colors on one's face, if that makes one feel more aligned with one's gender or with one's joy, little things like that can make it easier to go through the day and bring a little bit of celebration. Is that going to change policy? No. Is it going to make you maybe wake up with a little bit more, you know, internal desire to change a policy? Yeah, probably. So looking at things that are small that can make a huge change is a big thing. Um, for me and other pieces, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint and treating it like a sprint is going to hurt us in the end as someone who has tried to treat it as a sprint for whatever reason, including, you know, capitalist indoctrination. It's not a sprint. Let's, let's just stop that. Um, in terms of how to do the work right outside of the sustainability portion, um, connecting with people that are licensed and unlicensed. If you're unlicensed, connect with the licensed folks. If you're you know, and vice versa, right? If you don't have a community of people that do the kind of thing that you do across a range of educational levels, you are A, missing out on some good stuff and B, probably not actually doing that good of a job and you should check your, check your life. Okay. Um, we also have to divest from purity politics of, I need to wait for the perfect job. Good luck. Good freaking luck right? Or wait for the perfect activist. We're all going to fuck it up. We're all going to do some bullshit. And the recovery is more important than the, I will never be problematic ever. Like I would do a whole, we could have a whole conversation about how we're all problematic and are trying to change that or heal from it or repair it, right? Like that's, that's different than I have never done anything bad. Um, seeing where our gifts shine and focusing there but also keeping little tendrils. I'm thinking of mycelium. I'm thinking of tentacles here. I do certain things and there's only so much time that I have 
to quote unquote work, but do I know the people that do other things that matter to the work I'm in? That's going to be really important because A, that'll increase my ability to do my work well, and it'll also help me move in a different direction if I choose to. I wasn't always a therapist. I'm not always going to be a therapist. And so being able to shift in and out of different kinds of ways of doing the work is a way of making it more sustainable on an individual and a collective level. Um, another piece here that I want to name is, you know, liberate, shout out to Liberation Health and Liberation um, Psychology. For Liberation Health, it asks us to always be looking at the personal, cultural, and institutional factors when we're trying to look at what a problem is. So if someone's depressed and they see that that's their problem, cool. Let's talk about the personal, institutional, and cultural factors that are enabling and or creating the depression. Let's also look at the historic memory of change in your lineage, whatever that lineage is that could help move you forward or move you even diagonally. And let's think about some action steps. So let's not just talk, but let's see how we can move these thoughts into the material world in some way. So again, those are a couple of frameworks. Another piece here is around incorporating feedback into any relationship that we have. When I do work as a therapist, I generally have, instead of like a formal evaluation six months in, I do a little bit of feedback at the end. And I ask generally, what was very curious or are you taking away from today? And what was the most challenging part of today? And again, I could say a lot of what clinically that gives me, but also that just gives the client a chance to say, that was trash, <laughs> or I really like this, really did not like that. And I use humor as a way of building more of a rapport with people, again, both in the clinical space and outside the clinical space. Um, and I see that I have a, maybe a minute or two left, so I'm going to start wrapping it up. Great. We're on time. We're doing good. Um, another piece that I incorporate here, too, is moving with respectful curiosity and assuming that when people are doing something, it makes sense to them under some framework. If you don't get it and are trying to judge it, taking a moment, this makes sense to you. I don't know how yet, but I want to be curious about it because that way we can, again, better build connection. We're not coming from a place of judgment. We're coming from a place of, I trust you right now. I don't get it yet, but I'm, tr I'm trusting and I'm trying to build with you versus mm, you should really leave that abusive relationship. Clearly that's bad for you. It's never as simple as just leave, as many of us know. And so moving with that curiosity and assumption of this somehow works for you, this somehow makes sense, can build a, be a better bridge. Um, and then finally, I'll leave it at getting really well-versed in dialectics, which is just a fancy way of saying this and rather than this instead of, or this or, or this versus a lot of things are true at the same time they don't have to make logical sense they just are and trying to fight that is one thing that you know keeps a lot of us stuck with the but the dsm has the true answer no it doesn't no it doesn't um so i'll leave it there i'm, I'm sure i could say more and i'm sure we would all love hearing you say more um would anyone does anyone have a thought a comment I do want to say that the growing culture of surveillance isn't new. It's 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 always been there, um, and surveillance in many different contexts. Um, so psychiatry is really working on something now. Well, I should say specifically digital psychiatry as a field is working on something called digital phenotyping which would be able to uh, diagnose you based on your use of your cell phone or your devices, like what the brightness setting is what the type of content you were looking at and and and, and that would interface and, and, and relate to the entire diagnosis and what's happening is is that we're now seeing new forms of oppression that didn't exist before or rather um using the the a similar blueprint but in a different context right and and, and a lot of that is, is is slipping under our attention so when i to, to your point on surveillance and and that piece that's something that, that, that I think in terms of tangible advocacy we could start doing, now is the time because they're really trying to push for it. Um, I think uh, a, another piece too is, 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 is I really want to interrogate that idea of what we define as, um, 
our understanding of emotional distress currently in our society and how we approach mental health, right? So, so often, you know, there, the, there are folks that, that I find in many different spaces who never really thought that they could identify with anything beyond their diagnosis, right? And, and have identity freedom in that context. So I think challenging the cultural narratives, right, with neurodiversity, with mad liberation, with with a lot of these these things that we're talking about, right? Maybe, you know, and, and in the context of when we talk about mental illness and, and, and how people identify with their mental illness, does that interrelate with their disability, their their chronic illness? I've I've heard a lot of people who know like, oh yeah, I I I know that 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 how we define mental illness largely in our society is inherently damaging and problematic. However, at the same time, I feel it like an illness in my body. So like how, how do I come to terms with that and have these conversations? I think, as Ida was saying earlier, there are multiple truths. We have to hold multiple truths and then organize collectively, right? Uh, I think something that really inspired this conversation in, in the first place was, was the fact that, that, that there are a lot of uh, white folk who have access to the mental health system, right? Who end up being abused by that mental health system and would wonder why anyone would put, would want access to that otherwise, right? And then meanwhile, I see a lot of people in my community, right? Who, who are literally like, I want to see a therapist instead of being put into a prison, right? And they haven't really quite con contextualized psychiatric incarceration and mass surveillance because we've grown dependent on it. We've been told that we must depend on it. Um, so I think that there's liberatory work culturally that has to happen. I think we need to challenge a lot of psych institution licensure boards. Um, we need to make alternatives, right, like these simultaneously. We need to go to state houses and to, and to spaces in D.C., right, at Capitol Hill, and talk about the need for these alternatives, right, uh, and really, really advocate for them. Yes, and thank you, Vesper, for naming specific um, uh, additional specific steps that we can take to challenge these systems that are try that are surveilling and incarcerating us. And we are going to shift and ask Anjali, um, why is it important that we have people building outside the system? And I think <laughs> we've started that conversation. What is the power in that? What is who is centered, and how is this different? from who is centered in the system. Thank you for that. Uh, well, we know that just like has come up so many times already in this dialogue, the system is deeply professionalized and it's actually a problem that our social movements and so much effort, right, that people kick down to attempt to get free have been professionalized. That's not intrinsically connected to our collective liberation in any way other than maybe being an impediment to it, frankly. And so then what would a benefit be of operating as much outside of the system as is realistically available to us, being able to de-professionalize our praxis. And with humility, it's an honor to bring in an example of someone that has done that so exquisitely. Have any of y'all heard of Dr. Franz Omar Fanon? I'm lifting up a photo of him for y'all who might be watching the screen right now. So he was an Afro-Indigenous psychiatrist who actually, as a part of his oath that he had made to support the folks that he was working with ended up deprofessionalizing himself to play with this language. So he was from the Caribbean island of Martinique, ended up working at a psychiatric institution in the French colonially occupied Algeria. And when he was working with folks, he realized hearing story 
after story, right? Of somebody witnessing their family members be murdered, of someone else witnessing and experiencing their ancestral homeland be ripped away from them. Oh, these folks don't have anything wrong with them that needs labeling or pathologizing. If I'm serious about some ethical commitment to these folks that I'm supposed to be in solidarity with, what I actually need to pivot my responsibility to is kicking the French colonizers out of this country, is ending the system of oppression that is creating this alienation and dis-ease to begin with, not pretending that this is individualistic or a personal problem, but having the honesty to name the structural injustice that he was witnessing. He stopped being a psychiatrist. He took up arms and he fought alongside the Algerians to kick the French out of their country. And I bring him up here because Sometimes when folks are operating within the system, we get lied to through stories about, quote, professional ethics, quote, end quote, as if somehow professionals have any monopoly on ethics at all whatsoever. And I know that we can imagine so much better than that. I'd like to invite all of y'all to do so accordingly. Around that, I'd also like to share a little story related to a time after my mother unexpectedly passed away about 15 years ago. Now, my maternal grandmother is someone who heard auditorily all sorts of things, including voices that many people around her didn't seem to consciously have access to. And some folks who were operating from more of a tragically colonized mindset within my biological family might in hushed tones use the word schizophrenia when they would speak to my grandmother grandmother talking about perception that she respected and revered that they didn't acknowledge having access to themselves. And after I had the incredible honor of participating in a ceremony with some loved ones, I went to my grandmother's house with my siblings. And she, as we were sitting on the couch, was telling a story. I was sitting right next to her. And for the first time since my mother passed away, I saw her standing over my grandmother. It was the first time I had seen her so clearly in my waking consciousness since she passed. And I was entirely transfixed until I heard my grandmother interrupt herself. And she said, hang on a minute, Roseanne's saying something to me right now. And in that moment, I realized without telling anyone that I had seen my mother come to us and without my grandmother knowing that I was witnessing her presence, my grandmother was hearing my mother talking to us in that circle at that time. Part of the purpose of operating outside of the system is so that we can revere the wisdom of our perception, particularly for survivors and for those of us with access to ways of knowing that would get pathologized to unapologetically honor the wisdom that our ancestors are giving to us right now without labels like schizophrenia, if someone doesn't even know that ancestor veneration is a thing, let alone those of us that have connections with plants, with other species, unapologetically that exist in part in solidarity with us, even those of us that have forgotten what we're capable of knowing and having some respect for that support that is coming through in this moment to support us. So I want to leave off with that invitation to remember the survivors that we could be centering unapologetically, not funders, not gatekeepers, not censors, our grandmothers. The spirits, if we want to invoke that language in the English language, although we have all sorts of other vocabulary to speak to what it is I'm putting down, to have the rigor to even attempt to remember 
some of that languaging instead of our tongues continuing to be colonized by a language that never had anything to do with supporting us getting free, a system that's working real well in the service of maintaining oppression that is not broken, that is doing exactly the role that it was created as a part of ongoing colonization to perpetuate, a system that cannot be decolonized because it is colonialism itself. Thank you. And yes, fire. And with that, I would like to ask if people are so moved if you would like, if you would like to unapologetically remember, there's an opportunity to share in the chat, the survivors, the people, maybe even the places um, that we can take that moment here and now because it is so important to do so. And we don't always have the space. And thank you so much for providing us with that invitation. Thank you. And I know from the chat and from people's reactions, that there's so much that folks wanna say and we will have time um, after everyone has had a chance to respond to have more questions that everyone will respond to. So, but I wanna also honor um, all of the powerful voices that we are being um, gifted with right now. And to ask Gretchen and to please continue with the power of the chat too. I just also wanna shout out the vulnerability and the care and the information and the support you all are offering each other in the chat. It's beautiful to witness. Um, for Gretchen, yeah, given, have, oh, yes. you, I was gonna um, give you your question if you'd like. <laughs> I know, um, given that we're all often working with folks from a variety of spiritual backgrounds and beliefs, how do you see spirituality or the intangible fitting into this work? And what can this look like in practice? Yeah, I, I see it in many ways and I feel it in other ways. And the, the feeling is actually something that I'm, I, uh, I'm developing even deeper trust of. Um, when we first speak about spirituality, we must recognize that, um, as was stated earlier, um, in the traditional form, religion and faith-based institutions have played a clear role in traumatizing um, many, if not all of us. <laughs> and um, they, there is um, also uh, a, a, a movement uh, for integrating and adopting and adapting uh, uh, faith practices that uh, have, uh, I will use the example with uh, Buddhism uh, and, and my practice, actually the emphasis on lay meditation is a part of actually Western application of Buddhism uh, in, in uh, uh, the practice of faith traditions before it really uh, transferred to the West uh, with much more emphasis on ritual uh, movement. Uh, uh, community practice, the individualized private uh, meditation practice is, is one that's kind of blown up because for a lot of reasons, because it's great, love meditating, and uh, it can serve a role to manage black and brown bodies. It can serve a role to, uh, to, uh, de to, to convince us uh, that individual practices are meant to change and shift your mindset uh, so you can get along with or be bearable to others, whether it is sit down in your class, I got to keep, <laughs> whether it is um, our, our role in communities. And so I, I elevate in what I see, and, and I can't say, I mean, I help contribute to, to a lot of what I see, which has blown up in movements and blown up in mainstream spaces, uh, which are, I do see as, as spiritual practices. Um, meditation, mindfulness, somatic practices, many somatic practices. You know, ironically, we talk about chanting. We talk about other other uh, practices that have uh, come from uh, uh, traditions uh, that many that are indigenous to many of us. Uh, then the science catches up, and they're talking about the vagus nerve system. And wow, isn't it amazing to sing and hum? It really helps. Uh, with your parasympathetic balance. And I'm like, what? The monks who taught me how to 
chat uh, <laughs> a long time ago, but it, it, it so there, there is, um, there's also a great emphasis that I'm seeing on safety and security practices that really are minimizing um, existing symptom, symptom uh, systems, the harm of existing symptoms uh, systems. I'm seeing a lot more professional development in healing practices and building capacity builders for healing or capacity within institutions and organizing groups to heal. Um, and, 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 and a space for um, the spiritual, which is leaning into your purpose uh, and not simply uh, conflict resolution with others, but internal conflict resolution um, that to do this work oftentimes, I know I have felt uh, that I can be in a space of cognitive dissonance and holding that internally um, is uh, pure terror really it, it's it's it, and it is it is i think the work of spirituality um they i think that much of the in our healthcare innovation uh has emphasis the reasoning the reasonable attributes of spiritual practices um circle keeping all of that and but has really um ignored other aspects which are critical as we've spoken about collective capacity and, and connection um, because they're contrary to selling a product, they're contrary to, to building out the corporatization of care. Uh, and so um, I do believe that spiritual organize, that grassroots organizing, um, advocacy, mutual aid is something that very much um, has been operated, held, and generated by our, our faith institutions of various degrees in our spiritual communities, uh, and, and also indeed harm reduction. Uh, much, of, uh, much of the origins of it, and it and recognizing those who are uh, living um, with external attacks on their livelihood um, have to have uh, a space um, of refuge and as with state of restoration, which is very different than rest. I see it actually also, um, you know, almost a maroon community space where it is that you can go for your refuge to actually rebuild up and revolutionize. And um, uh, uh, as for me, the black church in its history in the US has been one of the most powerful institutions to hold those spaces. Um, it is where majority of money has been invested and continues to sit um, with black power. It is the space, the community space of feeding, of caring, of mutual aid, of counseling. And when there has been a deep breach between um, how those institutions have been responding to preventing um, and unfortunately perpetuating the harm of so uh, against so many, um, we're we're really in a crisis of faith. I see it. Uh, I don't believe we're in a crisis of faith. If folks need to be returning back to faith institutions, where I see is the crisis of faith in uh, even the protection of those institutions um, or infrastructure that we still need. We need to change those institutions. We still need institutions. Um, this has come from the person who just said, yeah, it's all on the individual level. Um, but the problem is the safe space for us to explore and have control over care um, has been in some ways robbed from us in, in the attack on these spaces of sacred spaces. I mentioned the black church as an example because that's just so alive with me as to how much of the civil rights and the organizing movement could not have occurred without having a space where there's not police uh, surveillance and we're losing those spaces. And I'm just really interested about how can we get infrastructure into the hands of the modern day, the contemporary um, um, builders of our spiritual heating and support. How can I get this into, how can I get uh, those resources so they have longstanding infrastructure? But then also, um, how is it that um, we can be preserving sacred spaces that are not recognized as the church institutions? Um, the burial grounds, uh, the sacred spaces, the water space, all, all of the work that has been done on climate protection um, is very uh, critical um, for 
uh, to, to address the cognitive dissonance we feel <laughs> in our stewardship with the earth and our relationship with other people. Um, that cannot be addressed. But one thing I would definitely say that I'm really hopeful about is the increase in uh, institutional recognition of death doulas, of the need for there to be, uh, there's, a, there, there's been a birthing, there is a birthing of new creation. Our creative space is actually where we have our liberty. Um, when we think about capacity building, which I'm um, in philanthropy, so we think about capacity building a lot, problematic term, but I think, are we building our capacity to hold this moment? this moment of transgenerational trauma? How are we building each other's capacity for adaptability and for creativity, uh, which is happening in these, in, in, these, uh, in these spaces? I see that as a goal uh, and a purpose of spirituality. So there are areas which I think are under-resourced and I just wanted to note just a few there. So with, as was noted, divination, um, I'm a big fan of bibliomancy. I, I like to throw open a book um, that, that I'm just feeling, and it can be it, it, it can be any book that I'm just really engaging and 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 really see what is speaking to me. Um, I do have a tarot practice, and it's, it's at a point in time people are like, does every black woman have a tarot practice now? Um, it is. It, it I say that with Jess because this has been going on for you. You know, we would hold organizers and providing and supporting an individual kind of training in that. But I actually haven't come across or seen industry resources to support that. It's just kind of seen as in an intangible. But I'm like, yeah, that for something being so intangible, I'm thinking everybody is really diving into it. And so thinking through how to how to support the training and the training of folks so that they're not simply appropriating and exploiting um, practices, but have access to the way to deliver with care for themselves uh, and explore. Uh, in addition, um, in building out people's sense of belonging, um, the uh, also uh, ancestor veneration, um, it was raised, it's very quite, it's quite common, um, but for many of us who have been uh, uh, disrupted um, from our lines, of ancestry, it brings up a whole additional trauma, uh, and and uh, needing to recognize um, that yeah, just throwing a little ancestor veneration at the beginning of your meeting, you know, uh, mention that <laughs> is going to work for everyone. <laughs> uh, and so uh, that is that's where I'm seeing so much juiciness uh, and so much uh, need for connection. A uh, big shout out to Song of the Spirit and Black Earth Wisdom, the Anderson is building out some incredible work. I, I was in a prayer and ceremony practice with her in December and I did quite honestly, I'm like, eh. even if it's a preacher's daughter, I'm just like, mm, prayer, like, do I really wanna be incorporating prayer in practice that is the movement um, folks? And I'm like, yeah, that's what's missing. Praying, praying to the earth, praying. <laughs> and, and, and how much I, we are taught to not take seriously prayer um, if it's outside of religious a religious context or a space um, and 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 but yet all the science says we will not shift we cannot without that sense of awe without that sense of of, of engagement uh, with something larger than ourselves and the intangible um, and so in trying to resist the co cultural appropriation exploitation, um, I come out with, with it with quite a bit of uh, a holding the humility of how those of us who are having to create almost a mix of practices um, because it is it is so difficult to access what truly was my genetic <laughs> ancestral practice. So one thing I'm like, people need to start paying like resourcing more for folks to have that ability that people are trying to tie into other languages that are dying uh, or that are being uh, really eradicated uh, uh, structurally and systemically. And that um, there, and recognize there really is no space where I believe any of us can, can operate, which is where there's a culture of a colonizer versus a culture of the colonized. Um, and that, uh, just like uh, how Buddhism has shifted 
in, in many of the spaces in the countries it is to adopt to and adapt to um, what has been a power dynamic. Um, I think our devotional practices, our spiritual practices that I'm seeing so many more organizer partners utilize. They have apothecaries now within their organizing spaces. Herbalism is huge and that, that's the work that I do. Um, the chanting and the dancing, but also just spiritual baths. Um, you gotta know who your limits are. I introduced spiritual baths at my foundation. Instead, they got a vibration chair. But hey, um, <laughs> the, you know, knowing the difference of, the, of, of folks' spiritual needs um, by at least uh, recognizing, sometimes we can come back at it through more of a scientific description as to how shamanic drumming, spiritual about this work on vibration, you know, I have my, bells right, my bulls right next to me, um, is very much supported by science, um, but I'm very eager to learn how we can um, restore the respect for uh, something beyond the science. <laughs> and that, that is the, that's the spirituality of it, the meaning of it. Um, no one will be able to um, stay in the space without it. So, but I just say that letting go of the reasoning and the management, I feel like much of spirituality is just like to try to give people their things so they'll stick around or they're, they're resilient. Um, I think we need to focus on revelation. And that's something that only comes out of spirituality. Um, this space of just absolute creative, have no idea where it comes from. People talk about the space, the need for revelation. And I think that um, faith-based groups have really brought that to the movement and we need to hold on to. I also think mourning, and I include chats, uh, some links that will be included up, but the, the power of mourning, um, I think has been much more fully embraced by those who first come at mourning as a spiritual or a pastoral care lens. Uh, and I don't wanna see it destroyed. Uh, mm -hmm. by, by our work elsewhere, but uh, we do need to work more collaboratively uh, to, to ensure that it's not ignored in our needs as we heal as a community. Mm -hmm. thank you. And Gretchen, yeah, no, thank you so much because you have opened up um, so much for us to, to think about and to sit with. And you've also really wonderfully helped us segue to our closing question for everyone. You've already started naming what are some of those um, promising community-based alternatives, like what are the aspects, what are the strategies, what are the pieces of these alternatives that look the most promising to us, right? You were talking about our death doulas, you were talking about end of time of vibration of beyond science. And so opening it up to the rest of the panel too, um, what do you think are the most promising community-based alternatives? And then also what, are the con what conditions need to be put in place to build them? What tools, you've already started naming, what tools and knowledge can help advance them? And so, um, you know, interest of time and knowing that we would all love so, so much more from you all, like so much more, but just um, hearing for a few minutes from each of you, what are your thoughts? I'll just briefly say, I think that some of the best community care strategies are the ones that we are already doing that we need to uplift and refine. Right, so there's so many strategies we have. I'm thinking about Black communities, Black Southern communities, where I am from. Like there, uh, like what was, what does it mean to go into the churches to make them sites of Black liberatory psycho psychological practice, or what does that look like? How do we make that happen? How do we go to like, and this is something we do. We work with a lot of um. We train a lot of um, stylists and barbers because we recognize that's a space where a lot of healing and conversations and discourse happens. Right, um, so thinking about how do we acknowledge where it's happened, where white supremacy told us is not real or legitimate and find those places, whether it's the kitchen table, the barbershop, the like, you know, the faith space, wherever that is, and go into those spaces and be like, let me share some of these things that we're learning and growing so we can potentially like, you know, grow together in those spaces. And so I think that, um, I think that, I think the spaces in, in my experience working in black communities, building up the practices that we already have has been much more phenomenally effective than trying to introduce something completely foreign to folks, right? So they're just like, I don't get this, but like, oh, I, I get the kitchen table because we do that. So what, you give me some skills and have a different kitchen table conversation? I can do that. And so like, you know, one of the interventions I often get, people call me and they always like talking about, I need to talk about something difficult with someone or address something or hold someone accountable. I'm like, well, you know, I do what my grandmother used to say, like, you know, 
Y'all need to find a meal that y'all like. If it's something y'all cook together, or sometimes it might be you go to get some church's chicken, right? Like, you know, but there's a tradition of food and particularly Southern communities or whatever around that and gardening, et cetera, that can be a powerful opener for conversation. So we have a lot more than I think that white supremacy is middle us believe we don't have. And so I think building and refining those is important. Agreeing with that. And I know that one of the questions that got asked to the hosted panelists is also about money and funding and like, how do you fund this? Um, funding is not just about money. So we have to think creatively um, in terms of what, what the things are that we are actually trying to get with the money and can we get them another way? So if we're looking for money to feed people, can we just cut the middleman of money and feed people in some way? Obviously there has to, in the system, money still has to happen somewhere in there. And again, that's where redistribution comes in. That's where mutual aid comes in. I'm gonna uplift a resource um, that I'm gonna put in the chat called Ride Free Fearless Money and the um, SELC in terms of looking at cooperative ways of moving money. If you're a clinician, again, I got a lot to say about responsive fee systems and sliding scales and building a practice so that some people pay more and some people pay less. And so this idea of thinking creatively and trying to see where you're trying to go and work backwards rather than we have to raise $2 million. Okay, for what? What are we trying to get? Um, and who are we building with that may have those dollars? So again, another shout out to cross discipline and cross movement solidarity so that we can share resources and pool resources. Um, because it's true, we're gonna need things and we, we have to figure out ways of getting them. Um, and kind of another piece on this, you know, uh, thinking of groups and organizations, sometimes we get really excited about all the different things we could do and pause, <laughs> think small, great revolution, love it. Are you doing something with your neighbor? Are you doing things with your best friends or your community? Sometimes we, again, have to scale down, not the dream, but scale down the practice so we can actually build it sustainably. So when I think of like, what are the most promising community-based alternatives? Honestly, I'm just like my friends. Like some of my friends are the people that I'm like, yep, those are the people doing work, people on this call. And it's not because they're grounded in an institution. It's because of the small bits of work that add up to something really huge. So just want to say that because we can, we can drop a lot of names, but are you going to go Google them? Maybe, but what can you do now? What can you do tomorrow? Instead of here's the resource list I'm never going to look at again. Okay, that's it for me. I am happy to follow up on that capitalism piece. <laughs> so thank you for going there. Our minds have been so monetized. So what would it look like to demonetize our imaginations exactly like I just heard you speaking to? So doing the thing, right? Putting the direct and direct action as opposed to immediately presuming money as an indirect vehicle for things. Uh, gotta do a shout out to the Zapatistas. So bringing up a photo of them right now, one of the most tremendous examples of peoples who have been holding it down in an autonomous decolonial space, right? So in Chiapas and the southern region of the so-called nation state of Mexico, overwhelmingly indigenous Mayan folks who aren't operating with a whole lot of money because they have a connection with their land base, right, and waterways that sustain them as one example of so many of what we can be inspired by and support when we do movement education, which is another principal invitation political education, not politically bypassing, right? There are so many strands within the mainstream colonial culture that perceive psychology as a deeper way of understanding things than other modalities. And there's such, right, sort of copying out of political literacy that's certainly not helping us get free. So unapologetically doing political education. So with humility, right? When so many of our loved ones 
ones are currently incarcerated are dying unnecessarily are being targeted like one of the founders of the fields of liberation psychology right dr ignacio martin barro who was assassinated by the u.s federal government right for a psychologist to be assassinated by the u.s government how about we learn about what he was doing right that might be edifying for us we don't have time to reinvent the wheel while so many of our folks are being harmed so really doing our diligence to learn from our social movements and then be able to write nourish our imaginations accordingly yeah i was going to jump in and say on the funding track i'll have make certain that we drop in the resources um if you are wishing to, to apply for grants, <laughs> our funding partners, absolutely. I think it was said in the chat, Third Wave um, does incredible work. Um, Estrella Fund, um, Grants Wealth Fund, Katali Fund, many of those who uh, are uh, have been uh, working with these questions and continue uh, to do so. Um, and, and yes, and allow for big foundations like mine to just like move it down there and, and to have that engagement. But our goal, and yes, the training with the Zapatistas is exactly it. It's, it's, it's a matter of generative resourcing and changing how we see resourcing. I think the work of Vule uh, and, and others in um, uh, nonprofit as F um, website uh, really does break down also how we can be decolonizing how we see resources and being with so many organizations that think that the the best way to raise resources is at that big level and not realizing what internal resources we have. Um, the, I, I um, am really uh, excited to see that uh, folks like, uh, I, think, I think maybe it was dropped, the People's Hub Community Care Clinic, um, as well as uh, Space like Spirit House uh, in uh, Durham, uh, North Carolina. What it takes is time. Um, 17 years they spent developing community conversation about care in book clubs and plays. It, 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 and, and I hate the phrase of meeting the person where they are. It's become this thing, but but they're doing it. I'm trying to better language, but it, it's 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 introducing the community. It, it, it is the space of recognizing there has it. It can come through music and movement, the conversation to then shift to taking responsibility for care. One of the things that I've just noticed most um, being the biggest fangirl and following, having just an opportunity to follow in the wings <laughs> the work that Miriam and Ming uh, and, and, and um, Mia and so many of other partners are doing is, is seeing that they're just, uh, they're, there doesn't have to be. Um, uh, kind of a, a build out immediately of 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 the work, as it was stating. You know, how how can it be broken down to uh, small pieces for folks to use, and how can we evaluate differently? I think uh, Nicole Pittman once uh, said, who has an amazing program, also with uh, 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 Just Beginnings, which is you know, how can we evaluate progress based on love uh, rather than based on numbers. Um, so really, in some way, how how the deepest accommodations and the shifts can be in how we evaluate. But the resourcing is what's the most sustainable thing that we have some control over. Uh, and we are in the midst of a culture war right now. We are in the midst of a major culture war. War. I think it is very much due to some of the major successes that people on this call and others um, pushed through uh, in decarcerating care over the last few years. And uh, so to lean into being, you know, a battle over our souls, um, how can we uh, operate quite differently um, with each other? And, and that can come through changing how we responsibly. So my big pitch is, yo, if you've got land, aren't willing to give it away right now, write it in a will to some organization that you believe in. Um, there, there's so many ways to transfer power without even hurting you. <laughs> and then to be able to um, do so in a way that might hurt you um, is, is, is the next stage. But uh, the, the, the work that is being done 
um, by allies and partners together, I think have really expanded new ways that um, some organizers find there is no need actually to recruit allies. <laughs> the, the oftentimes the first thing people are like, how do we get to the, uh, how do we get outside the choir? How do we preach outside the choir? You know what, you know, the choir can just rock just and fine on our own sometimes. And so the, 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 um, the space to be able to have a, a refuge um, and, and to resource that um, not only just within homes, but re changing how we define community to be inclusive of those who don't benefit from wealth transfer, particularly queer folks um, who uh, don't very much benefit <laughs> from the wealth transfer within their families, um, really uh, encourage people to think through that there, there's wonderful support through resource generation, through other space, but absolutely the, the uh, thinking through as to how communities can contribute. Um, so with the work with the elders, uh, and bringing elder spirit into our community. We pushed elders out. Little Earth Protectors is this wonderful group in Minneapolis that they, um, it's a you know a housing complex with I believe over 70 different um, uh, indigenous tribes represented uh, in this uh, housing complex. And every night a uh, cross-generational group goes and they're walking the streets and walking the complex to address safety concerns, no matter where they, come from, um, how can we resource those folks who have been on the ground, uh, our neighborhood watches, our, our, our building call centers um, to incorporate and in integrate um, a frame and a vision of libertary care uh, that uh, uh, those of us that may have had a little bit more, at least I know myself, a little more educational privilege uh, and access privilege uh, to be able to learn these mechanisms. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's happening. <laughs> and um, thank you so much. And Vesper, I know we haven't heard from you. Um, do you have your brilliance in one minute? I think it's reaffirming, right, that a lot of these things exist. Um, I think it's, it's reaffirming that we continue to do the work and that we're dedicated to it, right? And I think that the fact that we're even having these conversations now um, are an important uh, aspect to that. You know, uh, the fact that we continue to have these conversations is what's really going to move us forward in, in, in this particular direction. And when I, when I think about community-based alternatives, what's really hopeful about that is the sharing of Indigenous knowledge. Um, I think that's really what we're talking about. I mean, when, when you think about working through emotional distress and your struggles, I, I, I think of the the, the Degara tribe, I think of the, the uh, you know, my, my own tribes and the Kiskeya tribe and, and a lot of our elders guiding us through that, you know, talking about our experiences, sitting in that space, right? It all exists. It's all, it's all there. Um, and I think we can continue to do the good work and, um, and, and understand that, that it is in collectivisms that we find liberation. Thank you so much, Vesper, for that those words. Um, I think in many ways that helps us as we sadly are closing this conversation, but that underlying what so many, what everyone has been talking about is how do we collectively get free? And hopefully folks have heard from the panelists, the different strategies, the different tools, but also the different ways of being and connecting and visioning and creating that has been happening, will continue to happen, and that hopefully we can each with our ability to, um, to remember, remember our own histories, our own rituals, our own ancestors, our own cultures, our own realities, our own brilliance, our own wisdom, our own messiness, right? Our own, we are not perfect, but we are in this work. We are doing this work. We are learning constantly. The amount that I have grown in, in this conversation cannot speak to, right? And so that the hope is that you all, um, out there are um, being able to hold the learning, the relearning, the connecting. You've been doing that in the chat, the sharing, the, um, yeah, the inner connection, the humility and the curiosity. And so what I'd love to do is to also tell you all, please stay for one more minute. 
we have an important announcement and really exciting announcement about Ida's work and the opportunity to keep exploring and learning about this theme of community. Before we do that, to thank you, thank you, thank you, each and every one of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Thank you for your honesty, right? Thank you for your um, resources and thank you for your energies and your very being. Thank you so much, Myla. And I just want to echo that um, gratitude to all of the panelists for the brilliance and the wisdom and the tools and the strategies and excited to keep coming back to this recording and continue to learn and grow um, with all of you. And I also want to shout out a gratitude to the access team, our interpreters, our captioner, tech support, the entire Ida team behind this. And we're going to throw a slide on the screen in a minute. And yes, please do hang on before you leave, because we have a really exciting announcement like um, Maya was shared around how you can keep learning around these themes. And in fact, um, so much of what's been shared this evening and what I've seen people longing to learn about in the chat is exactly what we are going to be able to share with you all. So Alexa, if you are able to share your screen, we'll keep it really brief, but here it is. So basically this announcement is that Ida, um, we are launching right now, as of this second, uh, Cultivating Community, Creating the Conditions for Care, which is Ida's spring 2022 virtual training series. It's going to be running between April and June of this year, and Lilla is dropping the links in the chat. I think there's an Eventbrite link as well that will take you right there. And if we go to the next slide, just to give you a little preview of some of what we'll be talking about, which again, really resonant with a lot of what we've been learning this evening. We're going to be talking about how we can shift the healing paradigm from individualism, I've seen a lot of people talking about that towards collectivism, how we can equalize power. We're talking about access and interdependence how we can nourish relationships through practice of trust, intimacy, and consent, uh, centered belonging, how do we create space for belonging and connection, and then um, a closing session about how we can hold difference. There's been a lot of conversation um, around both and and polyphony and multiple truths, and that class is really going to be about how we can lean into generative conflict to uh, move towards liberatory futures. So links are in the chat. We'll drop them a couple more times. We would love to have you um, learn alongside us um, and learn from you this spring. And I just wanna shout out, yes, we will offer scholarships. The scholarships are linked on the landing page that Loa just dropped. We have 25 scholarship positions that are open and you can apply on our website. Um, and we will put this information in email. Um, yeah, just a huge shout out to Ida's training committee who has put in an enormous amount of love and care and attention and labor into this, as well as all of the panelists and all of you who's, um, you know, wisdom is, is leading into this conversation too. So we'll go to the last slide before we close, which is just to say you will be receiving a follow-up email from us in the next couple of days with the recording of this event, all of the links to all of the amazing resources that have been shared, how you can stay in touch with Ida and with your panelists. So if you enjoyed this conversation, we hope you'll, you know, uh, continue to be engaged. Uh, we also have a membership and we would love to uh, continue to see you in some capacity. So. We can take down the slides and I invite everybody on the panel and organizing team if you want to come off video and just wave in gratitude and thank you all so much again for a wonderful conversation this evening. Thank you.